Joining us now, former Secretary of State, the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. It's really good to have you on the show this morning, Thank Mr. You. Secretary. We want to talk about what's obviously happening with climate change and your efforts in just a moment. But I would be remiss not to start with the situation in Ukraine, the mass exodus, the remarkable mass exodus of men out of Russia. What do you make of that? Do you think Vladimir Putin has ever been this much in a corner? And what does that bode for a man who may see his only option left as nuclear? Well, let's pray he doesn't really see that as his only option. And, and, and frankly, I, I doubt that he does. <coughs> Uh, but it, clearly it's a very, very dangerous moment, and uh, he is more in a corner than anybody would like him to be because that's uh, not good for anybody. So hopefully diplomacy, I know the uh, Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, and Jake Sullivan and others are super focused on this, um, and we have to hope that people will come to their senses at some point. There, there's going to have to be a negotiation at some point. There's a nexus, Mr. Secretary, of mm. your former job as Secretary of State, your current one as climate envoy with the explosions around those Nord Stream pipelines. Uh, what do you think Putin is up to there, if you believe he's up to something? Well, our European friends uh, have been more forward-leaning on labeling it uh, as sabotage. Uh, we're waiting to get the facts. Uh, the administration is looking very, very closely at that, obviously. And uh, critical is going to be repairing it as fast as possible, which is an underwater operation, but that's going to have to happen. So there's obviously an environmental impact from this as well. What's the concern there? Well, the concern there is that if you have blown up a gas pipe and the gas is coming out, uh, which you, evidently you can see happening in the yeah. ocean, uh, that's methane, a huge release of methane. Uh, unburned gas is the most, uh, you know, the methane that leaks is the most destructive gas. It's 20 to 80 times more damaging and destructive than CO2, than the burned gas. Um, and um, it, it, it's, uh, it's responsible overall for half of the warming of the planet. So we have, we've actually, on the good side of the story, President Biden announced a, a methane pledge in Glasgow last year. We have 122 nations that have joined in this pledge to reduce methane leaks by 30% by 2030. If we did that, and I believe we will be able to do it, we have more and more nations signing up, it's the equivalent of every automobile, every truck, every car, every airplane in the world mm. going to zero by 2030, zero emissions. So that's a huge grab if we can get it. And very excitingly, the Senate passed the Kigali Amendment this week, which is the first environmental treaty to pass in about 30 years. And that will also uh, probably help uh, in the cooling of the planet by about 0.2 degrees Celsius. So that's a big step forward to finally ratify it, make it the law of our land, and have the United States uh, step up. And uh, President Biden and, and the team um, and the Senate should be congratulated for making that happen. There is a major UN climate conference scheduled to be held in November in Egypt. Nations from all across the globe will be participating in that. My question to you is, what can be done about China? Their seeming reluctance to participate in, in affairs of uh, climate control that other nations... Well, China, Mike, China, interestingly enough, uh, China has a plan. They've put a plan in place. We think they could be doing more, but but China is going to be building more electric vehicles will be put on the road over the next year or so in China than in all the rest of the world put together. China is, I'm not excusing China, I'm just telling you that China is uh, moving to do additional things. They are deploying renewable power at a rate that exceeds all other nations. They are the largest manufacturer of renewables in the world. And so China is moving. The challenge is that if we're not cooperating together, which we're not able to be doing right now, um, since the, the since uh, Taiwan, the Taiwan visit, China has suspended its communications with us on this subject. I hope they're going to come back, and I hope we can work together. Because take methane. Methane is China under last year's agreement in Glasgow said they will they will put out 
an ambitious national action plan for methane this year. We were working on that together. How do you do it? What's the best way to approach it? We could actually be helpful. And they could be helpful to the rest of the world and to us in, in reciprocal efforts that we make. Uh, China is deploying a massive amount of renewables right now. And so we want China to be able to move faster, do more, and it works better when we're able to cooperate. But China will be in Sharm el Sheikh. China will come. China will say to the world what it's doing, but I don't think it'll have quite as much impact as if we were able to cooperate together. There'll be about 30,000 people coming to Sharm el Sheikh. It's going to be a massive meeting. Africa is front and center in this particular meeting because it's taking place in Africa. And uh, we are all assembling in Africa in a few days for what's called the pre-COP, where we try to minimize the capacity for thorny issues to get in the way and to destroy the momentum and so forth. We're very hopeful, but, but scientists are warning us. I mean, this is where this is urgent. And, and yes, the world has to deal with Ukraine and the world has to deal with inflation. But we also have to deal with an existential crisis, which is the climate crisis. And Mother Nature could not be more clear to everybody about the dangers. Be very well-respected scientists warned us a week or two ago that we may have reached five tipping points. We may be past them, we may not, we don't know. But the Arctic, the Antarctic, the permafrost, the coral reefs, and the Barents Sea. That could have, I mean, that does have absolutely dramatic, life-threatening implications if we don't deal with it rapidly. And the administration, as you know well, has made this issue a priority. The Inflation Reduction mm -hmm. Act included $369 billion toward climate renewable <laughs> energy programs. For people watching out there, that's a huge number. What does it mean practically, though? How do things Well, in change? practical terms, President Biden succeeded in achieving uh, a... a extraordinarily important piece of legislation which has implications way beyond just the United States. This legislation will have an impact on the available technologies to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is suddenly, look, we just had a huge energy summit in uh, Pittsburgh with ministers from around the world and they're all talking about the Inflation Reduction Act and the impact it's going to have on them because they see the U.S. moving forward on technology, research, development, on deployment, uh, on uh, direct air carbon capture or battery storage or other kinds of storage or green hydrogen. I mean, all these different technologies that are going to change economies around the world. And they're now saying, wow, the United States of America is moving forward. That's going to have an impact on us. And they also don't want to be left behind. So they're saying, hey, we better get our own act moving on this. So the, the Inflation Reduction Act will be uh, an accelerator of act action way beyond just what happens in the states. But in the states, it not only has implications for people's health care, which will be cheaper, for drugs that will be cheaper, prescription drugs. It has limits on... Uh, uh, for for lower income folks, they will not anybody learning four hundred thousand dollars or or less is not going to pay a dime more. It has uh, it, it has a reduction on the deficit in it, but most importantly, it has really serious money as incentive for the deployment of renewables, for the manufacture of renewables, for the deployment of electric vehicles, the infrastructure for it. This is a job creator. You hear that a lot in politics, as people are saying, it's going to, this is a massive job creator, and it's going to put the United States of America in a very strong position to be leading on a global basis. Former Secretary of State, now U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, we spared you the discussion about the Red Sox. I heard Just it. Keep it in mind. <laughs> heard it. That's tough. Thank you, I Mr. Secretary. <laughs> Good to see you, Mika. Thank you, Mr. Secretary.